Welcome, everybody. Uh, Nick Klosky, our speaker today, is a co-founder of Honeypoint 3D, a 3D printing and mechanical engineering company in the Bay Area. Nick's worked in um, 3D printing for more than 10 years, co-author of a best-selling book entitled Getting Started with 3D Printing, published by Maker Media. Uh, it's now in its second edition. Nick has been a uh, San Francisco Regional Mensa member since he was eight years old and uh, looks forward to giving you a great talk on 3D printing and uh, related topics. So take it away, Nick. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that intro. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Nick Klosky. Uh, I, I have been a Mensa member since I was eight when my parents took me to just talk to some guy in some room and they just said, had fun. And I guess I scored well enough to, uh, to, to join. So it's probably the easiest way to, uh, to get into Mensa. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I have a, a long career in uh, the tech industry. I worked for Sun Microsystems and Oracle. Uh, didn't really like Oracle all that much um, in, in terms of the uh, environment and how much it challenged me. So uh, about 10 years ago or, you know, eight years ago, uh, my wife and I actually decided to start this business in uh, 3D printing. We uh, had a little store, um, uh, an actual retail store in the uh, Montclair district of Oakland in uh, Northern California here. And we tried to kind of do a little retail 3D printing type of thing right when 3D printing was at its, its hype. So this was about eight years ago. We did classes there, we kind of trained people, and uh, we quickly found that the franchise model for 3D printing in terms of like opening up many stores wasn't really something that we wanted to get into. So we decided to switch over our company more to be uh, business services. So mechanical engineering, uh, 3D printing for our clients, and, uh, and moving to training. So that's kind of what our business is right now. We do mechanical engineering, which is, you know, all of the, the work behind the scenes to create 3D models that would then get sent to 3D printing or to manufacturing. And another part of our business is kind of education and consulting. Uh, we have a very strong belief in our company that the more people who come into this industry, the better. So we focus our training on free or low cost tools to do mechanical engineering, 3D printing, um, and it, get as many people as possible enjoying this kind of cool control over the physical world. Uh, so what I'm gonna be doing is I have a little presentation I'm going to switch to that will go over the history of 3D printing and where it is today and uh, some of the things that are uh, very, very relevant to the COVID response and uh, not a very long presentation. And I'm sure that will bring up some questions and I will uh, come back and have more of a free form discussion. But I certainly do want to, uh, oh, I can't, I guess I can't share my screen. Uh, let me set that up for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but you know, in general, uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the in the chat, and then at the uh, at the end, I can open it up to uh, voice questions. I'll probably answer a lot of your questions, uh, hopefully. But you know, uh, if you uh, if you have something really really uh, emergent, then uh, then you can certainly ask. So uh, there we go. So let me share this screen. Great. You guys can all can you see that, Mike? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So. We authored a book, um, and this kind of shows you that a lot of the things that happens in the 3D printing world changes very quickly. This is our first edition of our book uh, called Getting Started with 3D Printing, published by Maker Media. Maker Media was uh, the organization who put on all of the maker fairs that you might have heard about in uh, San Mateo and New York and many maker fairs across the world, who also published uh, Make Magazine. Uh, well, you know, Maker media went out of business. Uh, they, they couldn't survive uh, due to a few different reasons. Um, and now they are uh, revitalized under a, a slightly similar name called make.co. And so they chose our book 
to be one of their uh, first couple books that they're coming out with under this new brand name. So it is going into second edition, not published by Maker Media anymore, but uh, that is our book. And this was actually uh, one of the best selling books in 3D printing, uh, highly rated on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and, and all of that. Uh, so this is a this is an interest curve. It's very cool. You can go onto Google and do a search for uh, it's called Google Trends and see what people are searching for over time. This shows right here that three D printing really didn't have much of an interest until about when we started our store, which was about two thousand twelve, and then it went up and has stayed on a slightly elevated trend since then. The reason why it went up, um, you know, around uh, December of 2012 was all of the news articles coming out with the people that were 3D printing guns, right? And so everybody got all up in arms about, about 3D printed weapons, that they were going to be everywhere, and uh, that kind of kick-started a lot of this. Um, but also at the same time, the technology to bring 3D printing uh, came back into uh, the the or came into the consumer realm as well, so it was kind of fortuitous. Um, you know, you might have recently heard about three D printing's pr printing's response. Um, here, let me actually stop this because I, I want you guys to. I, I like to have FaceTime when I'm, when I'm presenting. Uh, you you might have seen the, the the response with the three D printing world to the uh, COVID crisis, right? With the with the virus. Uh, there were, and there still is, you know, quite a shortage of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, with for physicians around the world. There are many designs that came out in the 3D printing world to help uh, allay a little bit those uh, those worries. You know, I personally printed about 45 uh, face shields on my just little 3D printers at home that I delivered to some friends who worked at UCSF, and uh, over. Uh, the entire world, tens of thousands of face shields were printed by individual 3D printing people. And these are not necessarily businesses. These were just, these were just people that went out like me, having to go like knock on tap plastics windows to try to get you know, plastic to put on the 3D printed parts that I made. And uh, this was an example, once I go back to the screen share, of an open source design that was created in um, uh, in Prague and worked with the Ministry of Health over in Prague, um, but then spread throughout the world to help uh, physicians not get sneezed on and something that would be easily sterilized. So this was a kind of very more recent sort of development in 3D printing where the need for physical goods was not met by global manufacturing and it was uh, a, a little bit allayed by individual people becoming their own manufacturers, which I thought was, um, which was very cool. So let me go back to, uh, back to this. Uh, so technologies, there are a few pertinent technologies in 3D printing. This first one is called FDM, which is called fused deposition modeling. You can kind of see this is an image of a nozzle and you see um, a little bit of material at the uh, tip of the nozzle. This is essentially a, a spaghetti strand of thermoplastic, uh, many different types of plastics that gets heated up and put through the nozzle and then deposited down layer, uh, layer by layer on, uh, to create a physical object. And I'll kind of show you what that, what that looks like a little bit later. But that is the most common type of 3D printing in the consumer realm. It's called FDM. I'll try to turn off. This is another one called SLA. This is a resin type of 3D printer. This is actually a vat of liquid resin that has a, um, uh, acrylic monomers and polymers and photo initiators, which means when it's hit by a bright light, it solidifies into a solid, uh, um, into, it just into a solid. And you can kind of see here that at the bottom, there's a liquid in this vat and the object gets hit, uh, um, actually a laser from underneath traces a pattern uh, solidifying the resin. And then once it's done, you'll see the, uh, the object pull up like that and then go down a little bit less. And essentially the object is getting pulled out of the liquid layer by layer, uh, in this case, upside down. Um, so this is also a consumer technology that can create things like this in terms of this detailed off of a consumer printer. 
something like this could also be created with, with things that are moving and come assembled off of the printer because it's able to create extremely fine structures that essentially break um, when you touch it and then spin on larger structures that, that don't break. So SLA is called stereolithography, stereo for light and lithography for writing, um, and then A for apparatus, you know, uh, a doodad. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's the other most common type of 3D printing in the consumer realm. Um, there are other types, many other types in the professional realm. Um, this process right here is called SLS Selective Laser Sintering. And this actually, if I go ahead a little bit here, um, starts with a powder bed that gets hit with a laser in very specific places. And then another layer of powder, let me, um, another layer of powder is deposited on top, and then that gets layer, uh, lasered in certain places, essentially melting one layer into the other. Where the, la where the laser does not hit, no, nothing, gets, uh, nothing gets melted, so that somebody later can come on and uh, brush the unmelted powder away, and you have your object and uh, they go and clean it with, you know, airbrushes and, and uh, things to kind of blow off all of the, uh, the powder. And you're left with, in this case, full color items uh, or monochrome items and, um, you know, very, very detailed sort of stuff. The very cool part about this is that you can print many things at once because you kind of laser an entire layer at a time. And it doesn't actually show that. But... Uh, um, very, very cool technology, and this is, this is much more expensive sort of thing. The most expensive technique is called DMLS, direct metal laser sintering. So it's the same exact thing as I, as I just said, except instead of a bed of plastic type powder, you are lasering a bed of metal powder with a laser. So you can see that this is uh, essentially melting one part or one layer and then of, uh, uh, this is probably stainless steel powder. And then once this part is fully uh, melted in, in whatever areas it needs, a little spreader will come and spread another layer on top. And then the, uh, the next, there you go, there's the, spray, the spreader, spreading another layer on top. And then the process repeats melting this layer into the previous one. And if you do that over and over and over and over and over, you get an actual end product made out of metal, which is pretty, pretty cool. This is very expensive, by the way. <laughs> um, but it doesn't actually show the, uh, but I, I have some examples. I'll show you what this looks like. Um, but that's called direct metal laser sintering. Um, but everything with 3D printing, go back here. Everything with 3D printing, all of the things that I'll show you today are all printed in layers. That's why this process is called additive manufacturing. You start with nothing, you add material layer by layer in certain, you know, places to get your object. Uh, I'll show you later there are other things that 3D models lead into called subtractive manufacturing, um, uh, also called CNC machining. Um, that's kind of all part of this mil milieu of uh, advanced manufacturing that we work in. So while 3D printing is very useful and uh, it's not the only tool that we use to do things, so um, I, I'll, I'll kind of show you what that what that looks like in um, a little bit. So let me go back and share the screen again. All right. Um, so there are many different types of 3D printers. Uh, the, these ones that are showing up right now uh, were kind of one of the first ones made out of um, University of Bath in England. Um, these were called RepRap printers. Um, direct metal laser sintering, like I showed you. This is a different type of FDM printer that excels at doing very tall objects called a delta printer. Um, this printer uh, essentially extrudes a polymer that hardens immediately when it comes out. They put it on an industrial arm so that they can create sculptures that literally just get assembled off of the walls, right? It's the same code that runs this sort of printer that runs this little guy uh, right here. These are huge machines that can cost up to a uh, million dollars uh, for, for printing, uh, you know, titanium sort of things. Uh, this is a, a type of resin printer that is a well-known uh, desktop consumer resin printer. 
And um, this guy actually here is an interesting one that prints out of paper. Uh, and so this is a, a little you know, human face inside of here. Um, and they print out of just paper and they color the paper in certain areas and then glue layer to layer to each one. And then when you're done, and it kind of scores the paper. And then when you're done, you kind of uh, rip off the, uh, the, the paper that was not colored and you have your model underneath made out of layers of paper, right? So that's, that's one. Uh, MakerBot is a well-known FDM printer, uh, one of the most well-known, um, uh, all, all sorts of different things. Lots of different ways to make them. What you'll see with 3D printing, especially in the consumer realm, uh, there are some that are there are some that are very kind of fancy looking and kind of turnkey, but a lot of the printers you'll see in the consumer realm are not something you go down to Target and just, uh, and just buy. At least the good ones aren't. Um, they'll still have exposed nuts and bolts. Um, they'll, st they'll still have a lot, of, a lot of things going on with them that, that are not like a finished product, and that's kind of just where the state of this is. Um, I, I mentioned a company called MakerBot. Uh, MakerBot is probably the closest to um, um, uh, the most well-known 3D printer company. They are a little bit more turnkey than that, but there are issues with um, with some people's perception of MakerBot out there, and I can kind of go into go into that later too. So let me uh, let me go back here. I don't have too many uh, too many more slides here. Now, for 3D printing, you do not need to own your own 3D printer to do anything with 3D printing. You can outsource, which means you have a 3D model. You can send it to be printed in titanium if you want. Doesn't cost um, anything for you to own one of those big printers, but then they charge you obviously more. Um, but it's, you know, it's one of those things. Do you want to change your own oil or do you want to... Um, uh, you know, have somebody else who knows how to do it, do it for you. So you can go to uh, many different service bureaus to get things printed. This is an example of a Delta printer, as I said. This uses a variation of what's called a, like a, a pick and place uh, machine uh, where you would assemble things on assembly lines. This is used to, um, to 3D print very tall objects. And uh, this is just kind of showing that it's, it's very, very accurate and it doesn't actually show it printing, but it does this and it would extrude out material and then build up on those rails, allowing for very, very tall um, FDM prints. This was a little project. I'm not sure if this one is open anymore, but this is a, uh, a SCARA printer based on a different type of mechanical arm, right, of, um, you know, turning two different pipes and the, uh, the nozzle goes into different places, right? These were all different projects that people have made to essentially put a nozzle in a specific place to enable 3D printing. Now you can print with many different things if you decide to get a printer at home, at least this is in the, the uh, FDM world with the, with the spaghetti strings. PLA is very, very popular called polylactic acid. It's actually biodegradable. It's, 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 it's usually made from corn sugar and um, it's a biodegradable plastic, so that if you throw uh, that 3D print away, you know, eventually, after many years, it will just biodegrade into uh, uh, sugars and lactic acids. Uh, you can print with ABS, which is a very well-known acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, but that's a petroleum product that doesn't really recycle very well, um, but many, many different things. Uh, PET, uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which is this you know, uh, the, the type of plastic just in normal soda bottles, water bottles, PET, you can print in that. So that's very recyclable. You can throw that in your home recycling. So there's many, many different options you can use for, uh, for printing. Uh, so before I go into my next section, I'll, I'll kind of look at any of the, the questions. Um, yeah, so the status of the uh, 3D gun issue. Uh, so that came up in the, in the uh, there's, a, there's a company called Defense Distributed by a guy who really, really likes guns um, and really wants to uh, push the bear of our political system uh, in that he creates a CNC machine that has the plans for like an AR-15 automatic thing like built into the thing. So you just stick in a piece of aluminum or steel and it will mill out uh, something that will make an assault rifle um, uh, automatic, right? It's illegal to have, but um, it would just be untraceable and unknown, right? The real truth of this 
is that the 3D printed gun issue really hasn't become much of a problem. Um, you know, it, it might be in the CIA and stuff, but they don't, they don't tell anybody that sort of thing. Uh, the, the thermoplastics and, and metals that you would need to use to withstand the explosive bla blast of gunpowder just really doesn't exist in any home printer. You can't reliably create something that you could use maybe more than once, and even once it might blow up in your hand. So, um, you know, it takes probably up to probably about an eighty or ninety thousand dollar printer to print a gun, and at that point, you could probably just go buy a gun, right? So, uh, um, it hasn't really propagated since that two thousand thirteen or two thousand twelve hysteria. Um, it, it just really hasn't hasn't happened. Um, yeah, so a uh, question was uh, stainless steel and titanium were mentioned. The 3D models that you use to create, um, you know, anything, like I'm going to talk about this later, um, but just like, like this little thing, that, which is just a little piece of plastic in something I'll talk about later, um, this exact same thing that cost me probably about eight cents to make, I could send this exact model to a titanium 3D printer once this design was perfected and had it printed in titanium. This printed in titanium would probably be, you know, $600 instead of, you know, eight cents, but um, it, the same 3D model scales to whatever sort of material you want to print with. Um, a really, really good example and one of the, um, uh, uh, is something like this. So this right here is a titanium vertebrae that you would get as part of a vertebrae reconstruction, and it's made by a company um, uh, uh, called uh, Within by EOS. EOS is the type of printer that does this, and this has little holes inside of it that allow bone to infiltrate it, to lock it in. And these would be dynamically sized based on CT scans of people and, and fit, you know, their vertebrae. So it's a um, pretty cool. Uh, so can products use multiple materials, uh, necklaces? So we can print with multiple materials a little bit, um, but not vastly different ones. Different thermoplastics uh, certainly can, but um, if you want to print something with like, um, like stone, you can't print with stone, you would need to print something that goes around it and then fit it in. So we have a little bit of ability to do that, but not, not too much. Um, so HDPE, uh, not too much with HDPE quite yet, um, high density polyethylene. There are materials that approximate HDPE, but they aren't actually that, but they have the same mechanical properties. Um, and I'll talk about recommendations for home printers. I will certainly do that. Um, so Susan asks, can you take a water bottle, melt it, and recreate? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, I, I know that the Clinton Foundation and some others were looking at this for Haiti. Uh, there is a, a, a huge mountain of recycle, recyclable plastics in Haiti after they had the earthquake that they couldn't export to the U.S. or to Europe because it didn't meet standards for that plastic. So it was just piling up there. There are machines out there that um, they're called uh, filament extruders, right? They, uh, they um, take like plastic melt it down and put it into that spaghetti string. So the thought was is that you could take recyclable plastic like this and put it into a grinder and then feed it through to create the spaghetti string that you would use for 3D printing. Um, there's nothing like that being done on any large scale. Um, but you know, the thought um, when we talked to the Clinton Foundation about this was that it would be a way to make the people in Haiti more self-sufficient because if they had a 3D printer and then essentially unlimited uh, amounts of raw materials, they would be able to uh, you know, create all sorts of things that they might need. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the material properties. Um, so how much does the printing material cost? You know, as, as I said, um, you know, something like this small little thing was probably about eight cents for me to print. And I'll, I'll kind of show you what those prices are um, in a little bit when I, when I take you on a tour of a, a, a couple websites. Um, what are the challenges in current 3D printing techniques? Uh, the challenges are, um, the, the best way to answer that is the most challenges we see in our business is that most people 
are not going to end up with PET or PLA parts. They're going to end up with something that's injection molded and these parts are not the final material. These parts are a good approximation of that, but they're not um, the same as injection molded material, uh, you know, if you're mass manufacturing. So um, they still have to figure out how to get a model like this made out of their final material to do real, real tests. Um, are the metal parts considered to be finished machine parts or are they usually just blanks for further machining? Both. So the, this, you know, this titanium thing is done. It is, it is completely done. It would get put into the human body as it is. Um, but a lot of things where if you are doing something in metal, you may need a screw to go into it. Um, you wouldn't really 3D print thread holes for a screw. You would use a tap, right? And you would, you would actually cut uh, threads through it. If you need very, very, very accurate things for like screws to go into, those holes would be done through drilling operations. So it'll get you the most of the way there with metal, but then usually uh, um, you know, some sort of finishing is needed to, to get it really accurate. Um, do they have printers in public libraries? They do have 3D printers in public libraries. Uh, in my estimation, they don't last long um, because, well, no, I mean, I, I live in Walnut Creek and they have a couple of 3D printers here in Walnut Creek, but um, a lot of people don't know how to use them or the files are not appropriate giving to the library and the library has to spend a lot of time explaining you know how to get proper models things like that so um there are some robust public library 3d printing programs but they're kind of few and far between um and then I'll do one question and then I'll get back to the presentation. Is the sintered metal fluid tight or do the pores allow seepage? Uh, sintered metal and even these plastics are fluid tight. Yeah, if they're done on a home printer, the quality might not be there. So you might get little leaks, but if it's done properly, which it would be on a professional printer, they are watertight, um, airtight, watertight uh, sort of things. So I will, I will get to more questions after a moment. Um, but generally with 3D printing, let me share it here, uh, with 3D printing, you want to go, um, you start with a 3D model, you prep it for the printing, and then you printing. But it's really the modeling part, which is the hardest part. We could all think of ideas to 3D print, but actually creating a 3D model to solve our problems, that's kind of the hard part. Um, there are many, many different modeling programs out there. Um, some of these on this slide, like SolidWorks, DesignSpark, uh, Rhino are paid. Um, other ones like Autodesk, uh, FreeCAD, um, and Blender, and SketchUp, and Tinkercad, these are free. And um, I can kind of show you what these are, but there's uh, some free options and some paid options. The paid options uh, sometimes can go up to ten or $12,000 per license, um, but I'll show you some alternatives that are actually, I think, just as good, where you don't have to pay that. Um, and I know this is a Mensa group, so this, this product right here is called FreeCAD, F-R-E-E-C-A-D, um, -E -E FreeCAD. Um, and this is all done via programming. It's actually not done via modeling. If you know how to computer program, you can actually type in the equations and get very complex things without having to go on all that graphical uh, nonsense if you, uh, if you like a coding sort of thing, which is pretty cool. Um, but you know, SketchUp and Autodesk Fusion 360, I use Autodesk Fusion 360, um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a, in a moment uh, to do all of my kind of main modeling. Uh, but these are very popular ones. Both of these are free for, uh, for personal and, uh, and commercial use. I'll kind of talk about that. Uh, but I really do a plug for Fusion 360 from Autodesk. It's, a, it's an excellent piece of software. Um, and then Blender uh, at blender.org is a great one. And I'll show you what this looks like too. Um, uh, is very, very good for 3D modeling that then leads into 3D printing. I also wanna plug 3D scanning. So if you don't want to create some organic shape, you can find a way, either do it yourself or pay somebody to 3D scan a physical object. And then that gets the geometry in there to uh, later edit. Actually, let me let me stop this here. So when I when I say uh, 3D scan, what I'm actually there we go. 
uh, what I'm actually talking about is like this. I scanned myself, right? So uh, um, probably should have smiled or something, but uh, um, I scanned myself with one of my scanners, right? So something like this um, could very easily go into uh, creating a very customized face mask, right? So something where I just kind of trace around my, uh, my mouth like that and separate that out. There we go. I now have a very, very custom shape based on my facial geometry, right? So um, you have to, when you're dealing with 3D printing, you can think of the physical world as providing you ways of getting geometry, which you can use for other things. Um, another example of that is, uh, you know, the dashboard to one of my older cars. I wanted to create like a cool dash. So I scanned this. Um, let me, me kind of show you a little bit better. But this is, this is what it looks like, right? With all of the, the, the little mounting posts on the inside, um, I'm able to get where all of those mounted and, uh, you know, where the cutouts for the radio would go. And this, if you just look inside of here, it's just a very dense triangular mesh, which is pretty awesome. So uh, scanning is a way of, of getting very good uh, geometry. Now, of course, these are done with very expensive scanners, but uh, there are ways to get scans yourself uh, as, uh, as well. And so I just have a couple more slides, and then I will take your questions. So let me get to this. Um, so how low can the costs go? You don't need to spend any money at all for the software. Uh, this is the software to do the 3D modeling or for the printer, the slicing um, that I mentioned earlier. None of that needs to cost you anything. Printers, I'll show you some websites for the printers. Uh, the printers themselves um, can go down to three to $400 for a pretty solid consumer printer. Um, this is either a resin printer or an FDM printer. Um, around three or four hundred dollars. Three D scanning you can do um, uh, yourself for free, just using your cell phone through a process called photogrammetry, which I can kind of show you. Um, if you three D print at home, it is about ten times less expensive than if you outsource it. But then again, you have to troubleshoot printers that might not work or prints that fail and, and all of that. But it is uh, quite inexpensive to print things at home. And every time you print something, it's individualized. So um, if you make five of something, you can have one with one set of initials for one person, another set of initials for another, something that injection molding, like large volume production, can't do. You can make everything to people. Um, and then this can all flow into manufacturing if you um, so desire it too. So let me, let me stop that. Um, uh, there are maker shops, certainly there are maker shops that you can get memberships to that would have uh, 3D printers, of course. Um, so let me, let me read some of the questions here. Heard about a medical group in San Francisco that scans and then prints new hips. Um, how might we find groups doing that type of medicine? Um, a, a really good place, even though um, I much maligned it, is uh, Reddit, reddit.com. Uh, people kind of think of that place as a hive of scum and villainy, but uh, it, it really isn't, right? Reddit is a great place if you subscribe to the groups that you are interested in. Just general Reddit, there's just, you know, crazy people from every span of everything there. But if you subscribe to groups, there is a 3D scanning group in Reddit that's very good. And 3D scanning also groups inside of LinkedIn are very kind of business focused. They would be great places to go and uh, just join those specific groups and have discussions about that. Um, yeah, don't know if you're familiar with some of the advances in VR. There are actually programs that you can create a model in 3D space and export. Absolutely, I have a VR headset, uh, Sculpt VR, um, Masterpiece VR, and, and some of those other ones are, are very, very fun to uh, strap on a headset create it and then bring it into other modeling programs or just uh, 3D print it from there, uh, totally. Um, so I got a couple of requests for uh, recommendations for a home printer. So let me share my screen here and take down my little face and bring this, bring this over here. So a really good one, one of the, um, 
one of the most there we go. One of the most well-known personal, like consumer FDM printers, and this is the type of printer I would suggest people start with, is from a company called Prusa. Um, he actually has, he was so influential in the beginning of this, there's a, a style of printer called the Prusa style printers named after this guy. He created a company that is uh, very, very good in that um, it's an open source printer um, and which means you can see all of the design files for the, the printer and make one yourself if you wanted to. And they share, um, they, they put back a lot of, a lot of uh, intellectual property back into the community. So this uh, program that is going to pop up soon is the slicer for Prusa, which is how you actually, um, how you actually uh, uh, prepare things for 3D printing. And this program has a lot of intellectual property that they give out for free to help other slicers out in the world. So the, uh, um, the little mini here, which is their smaller one, is $350, and then you assemble it yourself. It takes probably about an hour to assemble. Or you get their um, kind of their workhorse one, um, which is you know, $750 to $1,000. Um, there are ones that are cheaper than this, but this company is so solid in its community and its, um, its product that I, you know, I, I have two of these printers because I've just bought them over time. So the Mark III right here, um, and then the little mini is, is a good one to start off with. Yep. And just kind of to give you an example is that when you, when you uh, work with 3D printing, when you work with 3D printing, you always think of, of, of ways to like solve problems around you. So I purchased this really cool little thermal camera because I wanted to do some investigation in my house why it's always so warm. And I thought it'd be cool uh, to, to do that. But then, you know, this bolting onto the bottom of my phone, it was kind of like loose and it was falling off. So I'm like, maybe somebody has, uh, has solved something like that. And they, in fact, did solve that. There is a website called Thingiverse like universe, uh, but not, it's called Thingiverse. And these are, I think probably six or 700,000 models that are free for you to download um, and then print them if you had a printer or send them to a printing service if you, uh, if you uh, don't have a printer. Um, you know, COVID masks, uh, you know, little ducks that are geese that hold keys. I mean, all sorts of things. Um, and these are all free files, so thingiverse.com. So I did a search for this camera, and lo and behold, somebody had modeled a little holder with a little like handle for this object to go in. And, and then I printed it, right? So it, you know, that's what this is. Um, this is, uh, funnily enough, uh, this is the uh, handle to an AR-15 assault rifle. This handle is used everywhere because evidently whoever made the AR-15 like made a really good handle, uh, obviously. So they use it everywhere for all sorts of, you know, non, um, uh, you know, pokey things. And, uh, and you just kind of slide that in there and then the camera goes right in. And then the, the uh, other piece that I said goes on top and it sandwiches your phone like that and you're ready to do your thermal scanning, right? And so this, this cost me about 30 cents of material to print, and it was done in a couple hours. It solved my problem. It's pretty pretty awesome sort of thing. So um, I, the Prusa is a really good one. Um, there are resin printers that are also inexpensive, but resin is kind of harder to print with because it has an odor. You have to put gloves on so that you don't get the resin on your hands. You have to wash the print in, um, you know, isopropyl alcohol or denatured alcohol after it's done and then cure it with a little bit more ultraviolet light. Um, if you're willing to go through that uh, process, you get models like this. This is a scale model of a human heart, right, that you can kind of see here, very good detail. Also, um, you know, the vascular structure, uh, I think of something in the brain, and this is printed with a flexible, flexible material, right? So I can, I can crush it. Right. Um, so, so pretty awesome. Uh, and that's, and those are, you know, three to $400, but that's a lot harder to, to work with. Um, 
so that was a, can we print a 3D printer? Um, you absolutely can. That Prusa site I just, I just uh, referenced has all of the files you would need to reprint all of the customized nozzle things for the entire printer. You would just need to go buy the things that you can't print, which are like the rods that it all slides on and the, the threaded rods that move the gantry up and down and the heat bed to like heat the, the bottom. Um, uh, but all of the 3D printed, like all of the parts that, that hold everything together, those are all open source. So you can download those and assemble it if you want. Uh, toxic fumes. Uh, the real answer to that is that I will tell you in 20 years if I'm able to talk and you can check back in with me if the fumes have hurt me. Uh, it's so the, uh, the, and that really is the answer. We don't know if the fumes are, are a problem. There have been some studies on what are called ultrafine particle emissions um, that are much higher for the ABS material, um, which is the petrochemical one uh, the, uh, made out of styrene, than there are for PLA, but there's still ultrafine particles that come out from these things. So just to be safe, like I have this, you know, um, I have like a little, um, it's actually like a marijuana grow tent that I'm not using for marijuana, but it has a really good ventilation system that just um, shoots outside. And, uh, and, you know, those were like $100 for like this awesome enclosure with like a fan and all that other stuff going out. And, uh, and I use that just to be safe. Um, you know, how much do the materials cost to make something on a 3D printer? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I will go back here and... Uh, go to Amazon and do a search for PLA filament. So one roll of PLA filament is somewhere around, you know, about 21 to $28 for a kilogram. So um, a kilogram goes a long, long way. Um, as I said, those things that I printed were, um, were just a few cents. So a kilogram of material is a, a tremendously large amount that you can print a lot of stuff with. Um, it's very, very economical to do so. Um, you know, a little, a little kind of thing we did was this was an assistive device for um, somebody who was elderly who couldn't open pill jars, right? And there's a lot of big thing about, you know, keeping people at home so they don't have to go into uh, skilled nursing facilities. And so um, we actually had the person grab a piece of clay and smush their fingers into it. They had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so they couldn't close their hands fully. And they grabbed a piece of clay, and then we printed this out of a flexible material so that their hand goes over it, and then it goes over a pill bottle, and you can see it's a flexible material that then kind of like clamps onto the pill bottle and allows for turning, right? So this was using 3D scanning, just a piece of clay, to get somebody's specific geometry to create an assistive, assistive device, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, thank you for putting the link there, Vikram. Um, what, oh, any thoughts on the popular but cheaper Ender 3? Yeah, so there are other uh, companies out there. Uh, Creality uh, was mentioned here, the Ender 3, um, and those are, those are even cheaper um, than the Prusa ones, um, you know, down to a couple hundred dollars. Um, in my experience, it is a trade-off, right? Just like with anything, things that are a little bit more well-supported and well-manufactured will have less problems. And 3D printing at home has lots of problems. Prints will pop off of the build plate. Um, if you don't watch it, like the, 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 the filament will kind of get gummed up and just kind of start creating a blob underneath. Um, that, I mean, maybe fires, there haven't been too many fires reported, but, you know, printing at home is, um, is all about minimizing the number of things that can go wrong. And on those less expensive printers, if you really know what you're doing and you know your printer and you know its personality, um, you might get very good results with it. But um, it's just more things to kind of go wrong on, on printers that are a little bit less expensive. Um, can you print multiple colors on one object? Yes. Um, I'm glad you asked. I have this little guy right here. So this was printed all at once. This is a little T-Rex um, that says unstoppable because if you give a T-Rex little little hand grabbers, its its arms are longer and it's now unstoppable. So he's super happy that he has little, little hand grabbers. Um, this was printed all at once in full color. Um, and so um, you know, even, even with like letters on the back, like all of this was all printed all at once. Uh, you absolutely can do that. Um, you can do that on 
uh, the Prusa machines that I showed you, if you get the little bit more expensive one where you can do five colors um, that will mix, or you can just upload it to a professional printer and they will uh, print it all for you in color and just deliver it to you. Um, yeah, ab absolutely, full color is possible. Okay, yeah, so pointers on photogrammetry. Um, so if you want to create scans by yourself and you can do a search for, I can't really see up here. You do a search for photogrammetry, F-H, uh, sorry, P-H-O-T-O-G-R-A-M-M-E-T-R-Y. Um, and let me, Make that a little bit bigger. Photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is a way where you take 60, 100, 200 images of something from different angles and then upload that to computer software and computer software will create a 3D model based on just, just 60, 80 images. This is what is used in land surveying in the past where they would fly over with a plane and take photos of the landscape and be able to work out elevations of hills and mountains. Same thing, but you can use it for, uh, for small objects. Um, so when you do a search for photogrammetry in Google, this link from all 3DP comes up, says the best photogrammetry software, some are free. This is a great list that will give you a, um, and actually I could put this in the, I could put this in the chat. Um, oh no, I just said I don't love 3D printing, but I, I, I do, sorry, that, on, that, on that little click there. But this is a really great list that, that shows you, you know, which ones are free, which ones are paid. Um, and I will uh, just put that in the, in the chat right there. Like that. So those are some tips for photogrammetry. Um, do I do a lot of medical creation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we do a lot of work for medical device companies. A lot of it is for marketing. Um, we actually have some models here where they're trying to sell very, very small devices. And it's very difficult to show what those devices are. So we're able to enlarge those devices uh, for marketing purposes. Uh, we're also able to do a lot of work um, for the medical industry to demo models. Like we're doing one where we, we show how a catheter that goes into, I think the brain like goes and expands to grab plaques or, or clots and then, you know, pulls them out. We're, we were able to uh, recreate vascular systems to allow demos of that. Um, actual medical creation for medical devices, a lot of the medical companies have mechanical engineers in-house to do their devices. So we end up doing a lot for marketing to actually show how these work um, in the body when they're outside the body. Yeah. Can you change materials? Yeah, you can change materials. That Prusa site I showed you has a link to their called multi-material system that allows you to put five different materials uh, and print with them all at the same time if you wanted to. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, with, and we just have a few minutes left, but with 3D printing, it's all just about the 3D models. Let me show you uh, an example of something that I did that, that is very different. This is a 3D model that I made of my house. Um, I used a laser scanner and um, recorded hundreds of millions of points around my house. And um, let me kind of chop off the, the top part here like that. So if we zoom in, you can, you can see the inside of my house and all of these little balls right here, if you click on these, forgive me, I live in California, so my, my grass is going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit dead here. Um, but this is my backyard and this model actually has full distance information. If I click on here to here, it says that it's 4.063 meters, right? So this picture it has behind it if I, if I go back into 3D view, um, a full set of points. Um, and I am then able to 3D print uh, things for my house, things for different walls, all sorts of that. That is all just about the creation of a 3D model, which would then flow into 3D printing. The last thing I wanna show you is, this is Fusion 360, right? So Fusion 360 allows you to create models very easily. Um, let me just put in like, you know, a little cylinder right here. 
nice little cylinder, 38 millimeters tall. And then, um, you know, do cute little things like, um, you know, putting in, you know, fillets and, and things like that. And I would be instantly able to, to 3D print something like this. The really awesome thing is these tools are available to you for free. Uh, um, Autodesk actually allows a commercial license for individual people for free. So you're actually able to make commercial products on this without having to pay for the software as a hobbyist. It's pretty cool. Um, from something like this, even in the same software, we can go into something called simulation. Um, I'm going to do a little, a little static stress situation where I say that this thing is going to be made out of, um, let's say this is made out of ABS plastic. And this thing is going to go on the, uh, the top of a door. So this thing is going to be um, perched on the top of a door like that. And then the load right here is going to be coming down with you know 40 pounds of force like that. And then I can actually run a simulation. Uh, well, I, I should have been able to run it. No, oh, it didn't work. Anyway, I didn't set it up properly, but um, you're actually able to do what's called a, um, oh, there we go. Well, this was a different one that I ran. Actually able to say that when I put, in this, in this case, it was a thousand newtons of force um, down on this, what would happen to your actual object if you were to put that much force on it? Would it break? Would it not break? And in this case, um, it would break uh, right here if you were to put it. And all of these tools are available to you as just uh, normal people if you just, uh, you know, obviously want to learn how to change your own oil and, uh, and learn how to do it. Um, but yeah, so um, how does it, long does it take to print something? It takes two answers. It takes long enough to be frustrated until you realize that if you wanted to print, you know, something like this, or if you wanted to make something like this handle, and you would have to go contact a machine shop, or you would have to figure out how to like, you know, lathe this and cut it out, it's a lot, lot faster than that, right? So if you keep it in mind, something like this handle took about two hours to print. Both of these components right here took um, also probably about a little less than two hours to print, so about four hours for this. But um, you know, I could have been watching a movie while, while this was being done. You know, uh, it, it saves a lot of time when you compare it to the previous way of getting something customized like this. And then, you know, if this doesn't quite work, you could make this longer and then just reprint it. You don't have to go do all of the work for all of this part again. Yep. Uh, let's see. May one use a lost wax casting like process. Um, by first printing our wax in turtle mold and then melting it out afterwards. Um, absolutely. Yeah, we, we have some examples here. Um, there's a couple of websites and I will share one with you. This one is called Shapeways. Um, this is a very well-known service that um, allows you to print in many different things. And one of the things they allow you to print is called uh, is is stainless steel. So these steel parts right here, like this part right here, was not metal sintered. That would be tremendously expensive. They printed this in a material that they then did a lost casting on. They printed this in either a wax or um, a very low burnout PLA, and then literally put sand around it, and then poured metal into it, burning out the uh, um, the material leaving the metal behind, which is why um, you know something like this little steel multi tool right here is twenty two dollars. Uh, very inexpensive to do because they're not actually three D printing metal; they're using a traditional process um, for this, which is uh, you know pretty cool. And if you do a search for like COVID door tool, there's all these little do door tools that you can buy in here made out of plastic or metal. And here's the really awesome thing. If you have an idea for this, Shapeways allows you to sell your ideas. Shape, this is made by somebody named Creator. If you come up with an idea and you prototype it and you like it, you can upload it to a service like Shapeways and, um, and Creator is selling this for $17. 
I guarantee you this is probably around $3 to print. But what Shapeway says is, well, you'll put it up on our site. We are going to collect our $3. What do you want to sell it for? Creator said, I think I can get away with $17 for this. So then when you buy this, Creator will, uh, Shapeways will get its $3. Creator will get his or her $15 or, or, or $14 just sent to them. Shapeways prints it, Shapeways ships it, and this person named Creator just collects money. Right? And they are essentially a manufacturer, but they don't have to deal with anything besides just um, putting this out on Facebook or trying to find people to buy any of these. And these are just COVID tools, right? If you do a search for um, necklace, like, it, you know, more in the aesthetic jewelry thing, there's, these are all metal, you know, $26 out of metal, um, all, all sorts of different examples. And these are all people trying to just make money with uh, 3D printing. It's pretty cool. Um, do printers need to be watched while printing? Uh, yes. Yeah, they, they should. Um, you know, I am okay leaving a printer running if I go and check it every 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, um, and I really know what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, I just, if I ever run printers overnight, I end up like waking myself up and going down and checking on them. I, I just don't trust them uh, because they're, because they're, they're just consumer devices from, from companies that, that have a little bit of, of experience behind it, but not as much as like a microwave where you just kind of turn it on and it works. Yeah, the, the website that I just showed was called shapeways.com, um, and I will put that in the text right there. Yeah, may one precisely print a bolt or other removable insert? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can, uh, you know, maybe not in metal. Metal is a little bit not as detailed as, as other things, but certainly out of... Uh, resin and things like that. With everything with 3D printing, you want to build in tolerances. So tolerances on machined bolts are very tight because they just thread in. With 3D printing, you might have to back off your threads by a tenth of a millimeter to get them to work, uh, but then they'll, they'll, they should work fine. Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, one of the problems with talking about 3D printing is that it like blows people's minds and then they never follow up with it, right? There's so many different things you can do with scanning and models and all of that. Um, a really good place to, to just kind of play around um, with 3D modeling is, um, I'll put this in the, sh in the chat, is called Tinkercad.com. It's a free service. It is very, very easy to get started um, playing around with shapes. Tinkercad is... Um, I should be able to just show it within like one minute here. Um, Tinkercad.com. And this is all in a web browser. You don't have to download anything. Oh, sign in right here. Sign in with my account. Um, and it's just very, very straightforward and all of it is very easily 3D printable. Like this. So you just say create new design and you can draw, drag out, this is all just done in a browser, like you draw, drag out a box, that box is there, you can now 3D print this. Um, you know, reshape it, you could put little roofs, um, you know, lift them up, put them like that. The cool thing about that is that when you, um, when you group them like this, you can see that, that this is actually done, what's called a Boolean operation. These two things are now together. Um, they are modeled Oops, like that. Um, they are modeled together and um, they, you would 3D print this and it would just show up. So you can play around with how shapes kind of interact with other shapes by, um, you know, grouping things together and like that. Now that's all one shape that you could 3D print. So very, very easy. Um, and then you just export it and 3D print it. So that's, that's, a, good, that's a good place to start if you want to just kind of play around with 3D models. Uh, this recording is going to be posted for, um, I'm not sure for download, but Mike said this will be posted on the San Francisco Regional Mensa uh, YouTube page. So you can Our certainly YouTube receive page, it. Yes. Yep. And uh, Nick, if you can send me your slides, we'll attach that to the uh, YouTube as well. 
Of course. Wonderful. Uh, we're about out of time. Um, I want to thank Nick Klosky for his excellent presentation and thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can, um, about Mensa, yep, there's a lot of muted applause. Um, if you have any questions, send an email to uh, loksec at sfmensa.org or, um, and I'll get it off to Nick if he, if it's a question for him. So um, thank you all and thank you again, Nick. All right, thank you everybody.